Welcome to this weekly series, TechSoup Talks. I'm Nicole Jones. I'm going to hand things off to our host, Sarah Washburn of Caravan Studios, a division of TechSoup who's going to introduce today's topic, addressing food insecurity with a community-designed mobile app, along with our guest, Kate Howe of Indie Hunger. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thanks, Nicole. And um, again, my name is Sarah Washburn. And I'm the Director of Community Experience for Caravan Studios, and we are a division of TechSoup. And my team collaborates with communities to design technology that solves local problems. And I'm here today, and I'm so excited to talk to you about this. I'm here today to talk with Kate Howe, and she is the Managing Director of the Indie Hunger Network, which is based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Hey, Kate, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you. It's so nice to see you again. So can you just take a moment, Kate, to tell us a little bit about the Indie Hunger Network? Sure. Indie Hunger Network is a nonprofit organization in Indianapolis, and we are a collective impact organization. So we were created to bring together all the hunger relief organizations in Indianapolis and um, help them collaborate and communicate better and um, try to knit together the different things that we do to feed people in our community to make sure that we're meeting all the needs um, by providing as many services and connecting our services together. Great. Thank you. And we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about more that more about what that means in the work that you've done to create this really exciting app. Um, and so we're here to talk about this community resource, which is a mobile app. And um, we are also here to talk about how it was a community-generated resource, that it wasn't just one person or one organization that set out to do this. Um, but So before we begin, I want to talk just a little bit about how I know about Kate and how I met Kate um, and her organization. Um, my team, Caravan Studios, facilitated a design, and, uh, a design thinking event um, which we use to bring together uh, community organizations and experts around a particular topic. Um, in this case, we met at the Indianapolis Public Library um, in Indiana to talk about how technology might be used to solve problems around finding resources, uh, finding food resources locally in Marion County, um, which is the county that Indianapolis is in. Um, and that is how I really got to know the Indie Hunger Network and Kate and her colleagues um, because her organization was one of the many experts who came together to um, do this two-day event where they were th thinking about the problems that they were facing, um, meeting the needs of their community, and then where they designed um, prototypes, paper prototypes of potential technology solutions that solve those problems. Um, and, the, and it was at this event where the first sort of um, ideas around this particular app came together. And so it's really exciting to me to have seen the, the people and the ideas and the really smart thinking that happened early on that now created um, this mobile app that is real and in people's hands and doing impressive work. Um, and so the other reason that, um, that I know uh, Kate and that my work, our work at Caravan Studios um, came to be with, with Indie Hunger and with these other organizations in Indianapolis was also through our work um, developing an app. Um, our one app that my team at Caravan Studios developed is called Range, and it finds where free food is served to youth during the summertime. And now also because of the pandemic and because of school closures, range also shows where grab-and-go meals can be found um, because of schools being closed and because those meals um, are no longer served in cafeterias if, if your school is closed. Um, and so it was because of this work with range and also because of our work with our generate and design events, these community-generated events, um, that we came to be in Indianapolis with Kate's organization and others. And so that's really what brought us all together. All right, so now that I laid that framework, um, let's start our conversation. So 
Hey, we um, often hear from organizations, nonprofits like yours, that what they want to do is create an app. And um, I'm curious about what you and your team were thinking at the very beginning about, you know, why were you thinking maybe an app and also kind of what your, um, what your hopes were and what you had hoped to achieve early on? So um, before we started this project, when people were looking for information on where to find help with food, they were calling 211, which is a, an information line for human services. So um, they, they might call just to find out, can you tell me a food pantry that's open right now? And they might end up waiting on the phone for 20 or 30 minutes because um, some people call 211 and have many different needs like housing and food and childcare and addiction treatment. They might have multiple things that they're um, asking for a referral to. And so it can be a really long wait on, on 211. And so what we were hearing from our community was that they were making their own resources. So social workers and mm -hmm. Um, school staff and things were making hard copy guides about, you know, to hand out to people with information, which as soon as you print that, it's out of date. And we wanted to create a way for people to get that information um, without having to, you know, go to the school counselor's office and get a printout sheet of food pantries. We wanted them to be able to access that information um, at their fingertips anytime through, with information that's updated regularly. And so that led us to the idea of an app. And we learned that actually most people have some sort of cell phone. It might not be a smartphone, but uh, for people living in poverty, I believe the number is 90% uh, that have some mm. sort of phone because that is their only connection to the internet. That's uh, only maybe the only phone they have. If they move around a lot, they take their cell phone with them. So um, we, we thought that was probably a good way to be reaching people in poverty or people in emergency food need in our city. So that's, a, that's what led us to trying to think about how to create an app. And um, we expanded the concept of it during our two-day workshop. Um, we yeah. realized that we didn't just want to direct people to food pantries. We wanted them to be able to look at federal nutrition programs and whether they're eligible, things like SNAP, also known as food stamps or WIC, school, free and reduced price school lunch. We wanted to include all of that. And um, so as we got in there and started being creative, we realized that the app could pr potentially provide more solutions than um, just your printed out list of places to go visit. Yeah, I really appreciate um, everything that you just said because um, it's so common that um, resource providers pr provide printed resources because that's kind of the way that you pull everything together and hand it or read it and give it. And, um, and so that is a really common scenario, I think, where things begin as printed and how do you make it more mobile, more accessible. Um, and I, I appreciate that you alluded to the fact that um, in this um, highly collaborative two-day event that you were a part of, that there were ideas that came from other people that led to this kind of kernel of an idea that you guys had and um, which made it so much richer and kind of helped you guys think it through more. And um, so thank you for sharing that part about it. And so that, that was just one piece that the Generate and Design event um, was just one piece of this really um, community-centered uh, journey that you and your team were on. Can you talk a little bit more about other activities that um, that the Indie Hunger Network was uh, participated in that brought more community ideas um, to the fore with this app? Yeah, so actually after our workshop, we um, our Caravan Studios created posters of the three different app concepts that our teams came up with. We um, place them in indie parks, facilities, public libraries, community centers, food pantries, and ask the, the public to comment and um, provide input on what they liked and what they didn't like. And uh, the app concept that turned into Community Compass was the clear favorite, but they were able to write comments on comment cards about things they liked or things they'd like to see added. So that was the first um, broad public input into the app. And then, um, we 
later in the in the process, which I, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but once we were yeah, um, go ahead. <laughs> uh, once we had a prototype app, we also took that out into the community and asked folks in the community, and particularly people who were using food assistance, um, to test the app for us and to give us feedback on what worked, what didn't work. Did we have information that they knew was incorrect? Um, was anything confusing? Was it hard to understand? We got comments from things like, I don't like the color scheme to um, this pantry is never open on Tuesdays or, you know, mm. all kinds of different um, feedback about, about what worked and didn't and things they'd like to see in the future. And actually some of their ideas for new features we're working on right now. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. And I also know that you guys um, earlier than what you just described, that you also had a hackathon that um, kind of brought the, the tech chops um, to the community ideas. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, the Indie Chamber, it's our um, local business chamber um, for the city, uh, they do an annual hackathon. So they pick some sort of topic of civic interest and then they invite tech people, hackers from all over the city to come for a 24 hour challenge. So they um, have a location that people move in with their computers and their pillows and their snacks, <laughs> uh, work on whatever problem <laughs> is before them for 24 hours. And then at the end um, there's judging. So the, the, I just through coincidence, I had a meeting with somebody from the Indie Chamber who mentioned the hackathon and said they wanted to do something with food insecurity and did we have any sort of tech problem that they could um, make as their challenge for the year. And I said, yes, actually, we have a great challenge for you. So it was really uh, lucky timing. And so they made this the premier challenge. There were a couple of other challenges, but we had 10 teams. Some of them are grad students or college students. I think there were even some high school students some were from local businesses, tech companies that wanted to participate. And um, at the end of the hackathon, at the end of the 24 hours, uh, there was a team of us from Indie Hunger Network who got to go around and visit with all the teams. And they did a little presentation for us to demonstrate the prototype app they had come up with in 24 hours. And we got to pick a winner. That's so great. Uh, I didn't realize that it was kind of kismet that the hackathon happened. That's a great story. Um, and it's a great learning to think about the different ways that you can bring different people in to create something, not just be, you know, hiring a company to do it. So that, that's really cool. Um, and so uh, if I under, and I guess one piece about the hackathon, then the, the winner then went on to develop the app. Is that right? They did. So, the Indie Chamber provides some prize money to the winner. And we also had a grant from our local newspaper, the Indianapolis Star, um, to work on this project. So we ended up giving, um, we had some of that money set aside to provide additional prize money that would go with a contract, which would allow us to purchase the intellectual property from the winning team. If they, uh, you know, if they signed the contract, they would get an additional $10,000. So, um, we That's ended great. up um, really liking the winning team's proposal. They were part of a, a small um, local tech company, and we ended up contracting with them. So it wasn't required that we pick them, but we, we felt really confident about them, and, and we've been working with them ever since. Well, it's been two That's years. That's great. So now I want to get to the exciting part, which is where you actually talk about the app. Because um, now we, we, we sort of led, led you through the journey that got you there. But can you tell us about what it does? Sure. Yeah. Community Compass has uh, um, three main features. So one is that you can look for certain lo locations on a map. You can look for a food pantry. You can look for a hot meal site, um, sometimes known as a soup kitchen. You can look for places to use SNAP benefits. So grocery stores or other businesses that will accept SNAP benefits and you can look for WIC clinics and WIC retailers as well. So that's one function. The second function is a chat bot. And that was actually what um, made us pick the winning team because they had this chat bot worked out where um, users can communicate with the bot and find out if they're eligible for SNAP, for WIC, for free and reduced school lunch, um, some senior programs and a few other things as well. So uh, that that is a second feature. And actually for people who don't want to look at the map, if they would prefer to 
um, just talk with the bot about everything, or if they don't have a smartphone, they can just use the chat function on their phone to access um, our chat bot, who we named Shelly after Shelly Suttles with the city of Indianapolis, who helped lead this project. Um, and uh, so you can, you can just ask, you know, you can through text find locations as well and find step-by-step -step directions to a food pantry, for instance. And then the third feature is a calendar that has local free events related to food. So it might be um, local farmers market that accepts SNAP benefits, or it might be like you were mentioning before, some of the food distributions for the school systems that are not operating in person right now. Um, we have all of that stuff, summer meals on that calendar. So things that are more one-time or short-term, we mm. put on the calendar rather than um, a static pin on the map. That's great. And now um, I would like to show a video of, um, of Community Compass so people can get a sense of what it looks like. And Kate, if you want to provide any additional information as we watch it, that would be great. Sure. So this is the smartphone version of the app and you can get it for free on the App Store or Google Play. You can see the home screen there. We've selected free groceries and you can scroll through to find the different things in your area. Um, if you select one of those particular sites, you get de more details with directions and hour hours they're open, things like that. So you can see an example here of um, what each record would look like. This is Shelly, the chat bot who can help you find all the same information, but also information about federal nutrition programs. And then... So great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I am such a fan of this app. Um, I just, I love Shelly, and I love the fact that you can access Shelly without um, having the smartphone app. I just think that's brilliant. Um, so now that you've gone through all of this, um, if you could talk to your past self, so you could say, hey, Kate, there's this one thing that I, I now know that I wish I'd known then. What would you tell your past self? What, do you, what did you learn that would have been really useful to have known in the beginning? I had no idea how expensive it is to create an app. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember we, so we, we met with Level Up Development. They're the company that uh, won the hackathon. And they said they would put together a proposal for us of what it would cost to create the app. And I think all of our jaws hit the floor when we saw <laughs> the different options um, of, you know, we could, there were different options they put forward for us with different levels of support and hosting or just creating the app and handing it off to us. And so there were, there were multiple different options they gave us, but all of them were far, far more than we were expecting coming from a nonprofit where, you know, we, our full budget for the year is usually less than half a million dollars. Uh, seeing something yeah. bust in the hundred thousands was a little jarring. So, so yeah, that that was probably the the biggest lesson for me. But we were able to work with the city to get that funded. So it all worked out in the end. Good, that's good. Um, so we're going to go to some questions now. Um, and one thing. Um, I, I actually have um, a, a quick question um, about before we go to those to the questions from um, the audience. Is so now um, because of the pandemic, have you seen a shift in the way the app is used, or maybe in the way you're providing resources? What's going on in the in the here and now? Yeah, so we um, we have seen lots of changes in open hours in distribution method and location even for some things. So we have, um, we've done a couple of things. We've um, revamped the way that we update the app so that we have a system we can quickly go in and enter, you know, every day if we have changes. And in March and April, we were doing that every day. Um, but we also have a button that we've put uh, sort of a tile at the top of the app that people see right when they log or open it up and it says, um, for changes related to COVID-19, click here, and then it takes them to a page where they can see all of the changes in one place. Um, so we've done it both ways to try to make sure that we're getting people accurate, up-to-date information right away, because uh, we're finding a lot of people in need of food assistance that didn't need it six months ago and may have no idea where to go to get help. 
Yeah, that's a really, you make a really good point there because you kind of had this audience already that you've been working with and now there's so many people who um, have never had to navigate the system, don't even know what exists, don't know where to start, um, don't know what's around them. Um, and so that, that we have seen both in our work with range and also um, in our work more broadly that um, at TechSoup that, that that's been a real challenge. Um, so let's see if there's another question. Um, so how, oh, this is a great question. Um, so how did you structure the questions and answers um, for the chat bot? Um, let me get the in. Uh, were you able to take your existing resources or, or was a radical rewrite needed? How did you go about that? Yeah, we really simplified it because we wanted it to be not a set of 10 questions, but maybe two or three questions that people had to go through. And so we ask, for instance, if somebody's applying for SNAP, we ask about the size of their family. Um, we ask about their income and then um, maybe one or two other questions, depending if they have a senior in the household, that kind of thing. And then we, we say, it looks like you may be eligible for, and then direct them to the state website to apply if they, if, they meet the first couple of major criteria. So we don't, it's not an exhaustive list of all the criteria for, for qualifying. Um, but in developing the, the chat, we did a couple of things. We, we worked with experts who have done this sort of um, enrollment for the different programs to find out what are the most critical things to include. And then we worked with actually with a plain language expert to make sure that in every bit of text that's included is understandable at a sixth grade reading level. So that you know, it, you're not required to have a college degree to understand what the app is telling you. Um, and yeah. so we then went through that um, text with our community um, partners, our friends that are using food assistance or have used food assistance and ask them to try it and see if it made sense. And then anything that didn't work for them, we, um, we would tweak a little bit. And actually, we haven't mentioned this yet, but we're just in the process of translating the app to Spanish, uh, which should Great. be um, released, I'm hoping, next week. And so we're doing that all over again, trying to figure out how to make it the most commonly used form of Spanish to make sure that everybody can understand we're not using any unusual words or um, strange sentence structure that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, that's that translation. That's really exciting, and it's a lot of work, um, and it's a lot of important work. That's really great. Um, so here's another question: What staff training was needed as you brought in the as as you brought in the way of supporting your community? What was the most surprising pain point? Um, do you understand that question? So what staff training did you need to do as you, as you um, started doing this, this kind of new work for you guys, you know, developing an app? Um, so so in, the term, in terms of the development process, we really worked very, very closely with the team at Level Up Development, the tech company. So um, we met monthly and actually we're still meeting monthly as we add new features and fine tune things. But um, we... Um, we work closely with them and they have been really good about saying, here are the things we need from you. We need the data. We need the text for this. We need to know, you know, we need you to proofread this or that. Um, but then, and then they have the, the tech tasks and then we test things out, meet again. Um, once the app was completed, we've done all kinds of training um, in as many ways as we can. We've gone to, for instance, um, we went, we've gone to our local WIC, um, several of their clinics to train their staff in how to use the app. We have um, offered training for food pantries. We pulled together um, community partners before it was launched to make sure that um, the food banks and um, Meals on Wheels and the school counselors and their local public school system and people that we thought might um, have people from the community asking them about the app. We, we brought them in to train them first so that they would be able to, and then actually the mayor's action center as well, so that they would know what the app was and how to use it in case people in the community needed assistance. And then we have training videos on our website and um, we've distributed training flyers and posters to put up at locations around the city. We did launch this app in February and then the pandemic hit us in March. And so some of the things we thought would work really well, like posters at 
food pantries to explain how to use the app. Uh, no one's going into a food pantry anymore. They're getting their food outside. So um, we had to adjust a bit and create yard signs and flyers that can go into bags of food at food pantries, things like that. But um, we've been really working hard to train people in the community about how to use the app so that they can share it with others. That's great. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's so much hard work that goes into designing and then developing an app that the, you, you, you sometimes maybe forget or at least don't realize how much work it takes to get it into the hands of the people who need it the most. And that in itself is a, is a very large community effort, as you just described, all the different community partners and the ways in which you're sharing it from flyers to yard signs. Um, so that thank you for describing all of that. Um, I, let's see. Um, oh, there's a, um, a comment in here about very wise to bring in plain language experts and then review with grassroots partners. So that's a, a kudos to your team. Um, so we're getting close to time, but so I have just a couple more questions. Um, so here's one, another one. Do you have a sense of which referral source is sending the most users? Um, that's a really good question. So we, um, we have radio ads um, on some local radio stations, both in English and Spanish. And, um, and, and so through a local radio station and then iHeartRadio gave us free airtime during the pandemic as an in-kind donation. Mm. So I can kind of see when the radio ads run that we're getting spikes in downloads. And so I think that's been really effective for us. I think more people are home listening to the radio too. Um, when yeah. people have been working and schooling from home. Um, and yeah, I, uh, we, you know, we have billboards, we have bus ads, we have, we're trying to blanket the whole city with <laughs> community compass. That's great. So, yeah. Um, and uh, That's yeah, yeah, I think when we see a spike in, in um, those sorts of things, sometimes it's related to an article in the local newspaper. Y you can kind of track the, the, the spikes. Um, so the more public yeah. we do, the, the more uptake we have. That's great. So my last question for you is what, I know that you have new features happening and you talked about, um, about translating to, into Spanish. Is there anything else that you're excited that's going to be, um, that's in the pipeline for the future for Community Compass? Yeah, well, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we released two new features. One is filtering so that you can look for only food pantries or meal sites or whatever that are open today. So if you don't want to see, okay, great, there are 12 in my neighborhood, but only one's open today. You can filter um, by, by distance from your location, from open time, um, from the zip code that they're in, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also introduced a feedback feature so that if someone finds information that's incorrect, they can tell us right away through the app. Or if they have a suggestion of a new feature or some other event to add, they can tell us that as well. And then in the future, there are a couple things we're hoping to do. One is to expand statewide. So right now the app is only available for Marion County where Indianapolis is located. And we're, we're talking with some partners about possible funding to expand across the state. And then the, wow. the last thing is a desktop application. So um, for some folks, you know, for the people who are actually needing help themselves, we think the cell phone version is probably the most convenient and helpful. But if you're um, an employee at a community center that's trying to help somebody get information, you may want to be able to see all the locations on a desktop version. And so we're looking into creating that as well. Terrific. Well, we, um, we're at time, and I just wanted to thank you again, Kate, for taking the time to share about Community Compass and all that you've learned and done. It's such an impressive community resource. We're just so pleased and proud and excited for you. Um, and I wanted to just quickly um, tell people where you can learn more about um, the organizations that we talked about today. Um, so please check out the Indie Hunger Network. That's IndieHunger.org. And um, you can also find them on Twitter at, at IndieHunger. Um, also, CaravanStudios.org. Caravan Studios is my team at TechSoup. Um, and you can find us on Twitter at, at Caravan Studios. So thank you very much. This was really fun. 
Thanks, Sarah. This has been great. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone about this project, which is um, really, it's been a labor of love and we're really glad to be able to share it with the community. And thank you for your help in making it happen. Yes, our absolute pleasure. We are the biggest fans. It's been a great experience for us. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Kate, for your time today. We really appreciate you sharing all that wisdom with us. And that's a wrap.